हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते एंड वेलकम टू एपिसोड थ्री ऑफ माय न्यू शो व्हाट्सएप यूनिवर्सिटी आई एम योर होस्ट अमेय आई एम एन ऑन्टरप्रिनोर बाय प्रोफेशन अ साइंटिस्ट बाय ट्रेनिंग एंड अ ट्रैवलर आउट ऑफ माय पैशन लेट मी टेल यू व्हाई आई स्टार्टेड दिस चैनल टुडे वी लिव इन द इन्फॉर्मेशन एज वॉट दिस मीन्स इज फॉर अ मेजोरिटी ऑफ द पॉपुलेशन एक्सेस टू इन्फॉर्मेशन और नॉलेज इज अ ट्रिवियल प्रॉब्लम एंड दिस इज एस्पेशली ट्रू इन इंडिया वेयर access to data is very cheap now in a world where information and knowledge is freely available what is going to be the differentiator between people who go to the top and people who don't quite make it it's my hypothesis that this differentiator is going to be the ability to think critically ideally using the first principles method now what is the first principles method it simply means to take any new idea concept a uh, social paradigm or problem statement and to analyze it free of any existing biases or dogmas or any other information that you may have been fed just to start with a clean slate and work upwards with only the most essential axiomatic truths that you know it is my belief that if we can empower just one generation of indians with the ability to think critically using the first principles or a priori method as it's called we can change the trajectory of our civilization forever and then there will be no stopping us so this show is a very humble attempt by me to that end i'm going to do this in a question and answer format you will ask me your questions literally anything under the sun and i will do my best to look at them and analyze them here live in front of you this episode is not so much about knowledge or information gathering though i expect you will get a fair bit of that as well the focus has to be on the analysis or the approach that we take to structuring any new concept idea or question now with that let me give you my last happy announcement if you find anything in this episode that is factually incorrect or logically inconsistent let me repeat that if you find anything in this episode that is factually incorrect or logically inconsistent you simply have to point it out in the comments below in fact i encourage you to do it and if it's a legitimate point i will send you one of my favorite books for free that's right i will actually take your address and i will send you one of my books for free and i'm doing this for two reasons first is i want to open myself up to that kind of scrutiny and b I want you to pay attention and I want you to question everything you hear on this channel. There are a lot of channels that speak to you as if from a point of authority. I want this channel to be the polar opposite of that and I have repeated this again and again. Anything you hear not just from me but from any source should be looked at like the police looks at a crime suspect. You must analyze it. You must think for yourself if it really makes sense and if it does you can assimilate it into your body of knowledge and if it doesn't you should discard it at source do not take anything for granted just because it comes from an expert right and this channel is going to be specifically to sort of put that theory to the test so with that uh, i hope i have your attention i ha- hope i have your support in making this happen and let us jump into our first question of the day So this question is from Akruti and Akruti has asked a very interesting question and the question is are zoos ethical and what about national parks think about that for a second are zoos ethical and what about national parks right so first things first whenever you want to discuss the ethicality of something you must be aware that you are already venturing into gray territory primarily because what is ethical for you may not necessarily be ethical for someone else in my understanding ethics are a deeply personal thing they are not a universal set of laws uh, of course there are a lot of ethics that we all can agree on like don't hurt someone and don't steal you don't cause pain and you know all of that but even there there might be people who don't quite agree with you who might think that it's okay to do certain things that you find unethical if the end is justified so because of all of these conflicting opinions that can arise 
you should always have the humility to know that ethics are a deeply personal thing and it's very hard to dictate an a code of ethics onto someone else right you can dictate laws you can dictate regulations right you can dictate behavioral patterns even but you cannot really dictate ethics because that's something that comes from within at least that's how i see it please let me know if you agree or disagree having said that as a pretext to this question let us now jump into the question itself are zoos ethical right and national parks as an extent not an extension of that but as a separate discussion so in order to understand this you want to first take a step back and understand what a zoo really is i think that's very easy it's a place where typically you keep animals birds all kinds of fauna uh, in some there is flora as well there's plants and fungi and uh, you know mushrooms and stuff as well but typically it's animals and birds and reptiles and stuff like that and people go there to sort of check them out and hopefully try to learn something from them and so on right that's a zoo what is a national park a national park is essentially a, a reserve forest where you are not allowed to tamper with the habitat of the local flora and fauna and they are sort of like protected zones where wildlife is supposed to thrive and be left alone right so these are the two definitions for these two things now if you want to get into the ethicality of this the first thing you want to do is take a step back and look at the relationship mankind has had with nature over the last 200000 years uh, roughly 200 250000 years since homo sapiens first emerged i mean that is the best evidence we have right now right something like that so if you think about it human progress or human development or human industrialization causes a proportionate or some might even say disproportionate negative impact on the environment now what that means is as we go from the you know bronze age to you know the industrial age the amount of damage we caused to the environment was exponentially higher then when we went from the industrial age and then piled on the information age on top of that where we are today we entered what is commonly known as the anthropocene era which means this is the era where the human species the homo sapien species is causing rapid and in some cases irreversible changes to the you know the planet that we live in right and i think this is not very easy to uh, uh, you know refute i think it's quite uh, obvious that we are doing that and if you are not convinced on this think about where just take a look around your room and think about where this stuff comes from where does this stuff come from i am recording this on an iphone right how is this iphone made this iphone is made from first of all the most important element is probably the silicon uh, because the chips are used uh, in the microprocessors and stuff like that so that comes from the planet there's a lot of metals involved in this there are a lot of precious metals they are all mined from the earth now mines don't just exist in isolation they are under uh, you know all kinds of uh, uh, you know biodiversity zones it could be a forest it could be an ice cap it could be a river so we are taking all these resources out of the ground and basically modeling it into things that we find useful right so as we make more and more of stuff we cause more and more damage uh even with a lot of recycling and all that going on it's sort of a direct proportionality if not a worse than direct proportionality right i think so far it should be fairly i'm not even going into the realm of opinions yet this is just fact and if some people still disagree with this i will respect your right to disagree with this but i think it's very obvious to me at least so with that in the background that the impact humanity has on the planet is adverse we are destroying far more than we are giving back what is the ethicality of national parks i think in terms of national parks it becomes quite obvious at least to me that if we want to have any chance of preserving these these amazing things that exist in the wild uh, you know uh, forests and uh, you know animals and bird species and marine life and and so uh, critters and insects and so on 
if we want them to persist for the future generations we have no real choice but to demarcate zones where they are not fair game because what's happened with humanity is we have progressed so much that we have become the apex predators on this planet we become so apex that we are basically out of the food chain and everything still inside the food chain is is uh, you know not not fair game in the ethical sense but fair game in the ability sense like we can go after pretty much anything we can hunt the largest animal that has ever been known to exist the blue whale or we can basically breed genetically modified mosquitoes that you know you know what's happening in florida i believe and parts of singapore if i'm not wrong where they are releasing these genetically modified mosquitoes into the wild so that they mate with the female mosquitoes and then the eggs that are laid produce mosquitoes that can no longer reproduce so you are basically wiping out the mosquito population so everything from the tiny mosquito all the way up to the blue whale ethicality aside has become fair game for the you know the 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 massively uh, powerful species that we have become right so national parks at least for me the question of ethicality doesn't even come up because if we didn't have that then there would be nothing left there would literally be nothing left so let's sort of put that aside zoos are a far more interesting topic of discussion because if you look at a zoo prima facie right if you look at a zoo uh, at first glance what do you see you see animals in enclosures right you see animals in enclosures in some sad zoos you see them in cages right. to understand if this is really ethical or how does it compare to what exists in the wild let's take the example of probably the most iconic wildlife species that we have here in india which is the royal bengal tiger uh, panthera tigris tigris right now with the royal bengal tiger here is a fact in case of a full grown male adult tiger the territory that it typically needs in the wild is between 60 and 100 square kilometers 60 to 100 square kilometers now what that means is that imagine a block like a square whose sides are 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers that entire area roughly speaking is the territory of a full grown adult male tiger right it's hard to imagine 100 square kilometers so let me make it easy for you the surface area of mumbai is 600 square kilometers so if you were to divide up the entire city of mumbai assuming it is covered in forest amongst adult male tigers you would fit in at best 10 tigers and more realistically somewhere between 6 to 8 tigers in the entire area of the size of mumbai right that is the amount of space that a tiger needs in the wild now why i am putting that out there first is because i want you to juxtapose that against what a tiger enjoys in a zoo enjoys is probably a very bad word in this case because i cannot imagine a tiger enjoying an enclosure that is 1 acre 2 acre you know at best 5 acres or 10 acres in size even that is wishing for way too much right on top of that tigers are solitary species what do you see in zoos especially in india you see multiple tigers inside the same enclosure which is not how they are supposed to be in the wild lions are a a, a group sort of animal tigers are not tigers are solitary so this was just to sort of draw a stark contrast between what that animal enjoys in the wild versus what that animal is forced to accept inside the confines of a zoo all right i am not even talking about all the other things that the animal has to give up on for example the base instincts of any animal are you know survival that is hunting unleashing that instinct and mating and procreating you know we are all programmed to sort of have that A, you know an animal in a zoo is unlikely to be able to do that and even if it does it's not the way it does in the wild so having all of that you know in context you might think that i am building up to an obvious conclusion which says you know national parks are fine but zoos are just terrible you know but this is where you want to take 
a slightly broader view and it's part of the first principles approach that you want to really look at the bigger picture right now what is the bigger picture in my opinion the bigger picture is that we want to preserve these animals in the future we want to preserve these biodiversities we want to preserve this treasure that's been given to us and make sure that we don't just lose it in one generation right one or two generations how do you do that you might say encourage more people to go to national parks and see these animals out in the wild and so on but here is the problem how many people actually go to national parks how many parents can afford to take their kids to national parks in fact how many parents even want to go to a national park in the limited holidays that they have per year not that many even if you go to a national park you are unlikely to spot all the species that you want i am a very prime example of that i have more than 14 or 15 national park visits safaris to my name and i have yet to spot a tiger and i am talking about safaris to places where there were supposed to be tigers you know tadoba century uh, kaziranga corbett you know all of these i have never seen a tiger till date i'm keep i will keep trying but you can see the difficulty there right now who is going to be the decision maker of tomorrow right think about that for a second we are here today somebody is making decisions some forest officers some ministers some politicians some judges some advocates these are the people running the show as of today right who is going to do it tomorrow when i say tomorrow i mean in a general construct once we are gone once you and i are gone who is going to take over from us the children right it's the children who are going to grow up think about it the prime minister of the future is probably playing around in some park somewhere dusty maybe eating mud isn't that true isn't it true that the star forest officer of tomorrow is probably pooping their pa- uh, you know their uh, you know nappies right now so these kids are the future they are going to be running the show and it is my belief that if you cannot create a fascination or a love or at the very least some empathy in this children's generation towards wildlife or ecology or you know just just the great outdoors in general you know they are not going to be incentivized to actually make decisions or construct policies to benefit these species think about it why would a kid that's grown up in suburban mumbai never been to a forest never been to a national park grew up in a concrete jungle what chance does he or she have to build empathy towards you know a, a, the majesty of a tiger or a lion for that matter you know you can't really expect them to have that and that is why zoos i believe can play a very vital role not everybody can go to national parks but we need to educate the children so here is the compromise if done right if zoos can become centers of entertainment as well as education which they are not today as of today they are just a place where people go uh, you know they spend a lazy sunday they eat some ice cream they walk around some idiots go and rattle the cages they throw peanuts at the monkeys and all that nonsense and people come back there's very little education happening right but if we can turn these zoos into centers of education and entertainment to build empathy and interest in the next generation towards these species then i think we can treat them as a necessary evil and that is how i like to look at zoos that if you do it right then they can be a necessary evil if you do it wrong like we are doing them right now well then they are actually not really serving too much of a purpose uh, i believe so that is how i look at the ethicality of zoos uh, akruti i think prima facie they don't look very ethical but you have to look a little beyond a little deeper telescope a little into the future to sort of see the greater purpose that they serve and i hope that gives you a little better idea of how you can think about the ethicality of zoos and i mean if you are interested in zoos and national parks and animals in general i hope you grow up to become a forest officer or you know join the department of forestry or the zoo authority whatever that is 
and actually improve the condition of zoos in our country because that is a desperate need which we haven't fulfilled in more than 70 years of independence sadly so that's that that's how i look at zoos and national parks let's go on to the next question this is from jayesh and jayesh is asking how can we prevent an explosion like the beirut port blast in india fair question let's first think about what happened in beirut right for those of you who were living under a rock beirut i think in august of 2020 it was somewhere mid year 2020 during the pandemic i remember it saw the largest non nuclear explosion that was ever seen the largest non nuclear explosion at the port of beirut beirut is the capital of lebanon right now if you want to prevent something like that from happening in india or in any place for that matter the first thing you must do is to understand why it happened in the first place that applies for any kind of question how do you prevent a murder from happening in place x you look at a place where murders are actually happening and you see why they are happening and then try to not allow such conditions to exist in place x so that murders hopefully will not happen right that's that's how you do things so step 1 is actually to just go look at the beirut blast and see what actually happened so here is what happened in beirut there is this chemical called ammonium nitrate its chemical formula is nh4no3 and all of us pretty much owe a lot to this chemical because it happens to be one of the most commonly used fertilizers in agriculture so no matter where you are doing agriculture you are likely to be using some form of ammonium nitrate or there is a new hybrid that they use nowadays i think it's calcium ammonium nitrate or something like that but the moral of the story is that this is a very commonly occurring very commonly used ammonium uh, nitrate uh, fertilizer and there was a massive shipment of that and when i say massive i cannot state it enough it was 2700 plus tons 2700 tons of ammonium nitrate sitting at that port right but until this point you might say so what there is a lot of fertilizer it's sitting somewhere so what's the big deal well the problem is ammonium nitrate happens to be one of the most potent oxidizers that we know well it may not be the most potent but it's certainly the most potent oxidizer that is readily available or you can find it lying around or you can just literally go and buy it now what is an oxidizer how do, why does it matter if there is a lot of oxidizer lying around for that you need to understand what fire really is what is fire what is the process of combustion it's essentially some fuel combining with oxygen to to release typically some oxides of carbon like carbon dioxide carbon monoxide along with water and so on that is your typical combustion process right it's fuel combining with oxygen to release some gases and some by products so it's also safe to say that fire itself is a controlled explosion fire is a controlled explosion the other you know the converse of that would be that in a lot of cases an explosion is a fire that has gone completely out of control right why i am telling you all of this is that ammonium nitrate that harmless uh, seemingly harmless chemical that actually helps feed billions of people around the world was the primary culprit in this insane blast that killed i think 200 plus people and rendered 3 lakh people homeless if i am not wrong and the blast radius within the blast radius the shock wave was so strong that it just shattered windows and you know structures as it went it's crazy if you haven't seen the video you should go and see it just to understand how devastating it can be so this is what happened now i tried to look it up uh, the the prime the chemistry of it primarily because i'm a bit of a nerd uh, surprisingly there is not a whole lot of you know uh, authoritative analysis on exactly what happened step by step which i understand because if you look at the before and after photos of the area where the blast took place the blast basically obliterated everything around it 
like the warehouse in which the blast happened is now a crater that's under water that's how mad it was all right but looking at the footage and looking at some you know data and some reading and all that what i can surmise is that there was a fire that was visible for a long time what happened is that the fire probably led to the ammonium nitrate which is a very strong oxidizer which is a rich source of oxygen to a fuel it's a far more effective source of oxygen than the air around us it combined with some sort of fuel that led to an explosion right but it doesn't stop there because i was looking at the footage and there is this there is this massive vertical column cloud of reddish brown gas which is very typical uh, to no2 the gas no2 and then i looked at the thermal decomposition of uh, ammonium nitrate now maybe this is getting too much chemistry so forgive me i will be done with this chemistry part in under 30 seconds but what happens is when you heat if you take an ammonium nitrate pellet it comes in pellets and you take a lighter and you you know heat it it's not going to explode nothing is going to happen right but if you reach temperatures of about 320 degrees then something called thermal decomposition take place which means at sufficient heat or temperature it breaks down by itself and it's an exothermic reaction which means it releases heat right around 320 degrees and at this point nitrous oxide is released n2o which is also known as laughing gas which you might find um in a gynecologist office i believe or a dentist or even at some parties you know uh, you have that from time to time uh not in india but uh, in in europe and in new zealand and all that it's very common in parties so uh, it's it's fairly harmless if you if in very small quantities but it can become a big problem in large quantities so that's your nitrous oxide laughing gas so there is what i noticed in the video is that there was a first explosion which was just ash colored plume of smoke uh and that makes sense because nitrous oxide is a colorless gas all right and then a little while later there was a second explosion which caused this massive plume of reddish brown gas and it was just a enormous explosion and when i looked at the thermal decomposition of ammonium nitrate what i saw is that around 850 or 860 degrees there is a second thermal decomposition of ammonium nitrate and this decomposition releases no2 which has that characteristic reddish brown coloration which is rare i mean you don't usually see that in a fire or an explosion you know it's very typical to no2 and so my sense is that there was a fire it combined with uh, you know the ammonium nitrate so fuel met oxidizer and there was a rising temperature which led to the first blast around 320 degrees i believe and then that led to the temperature rising to close to 850 868 70 degrees and that basically detonated the thermal decomposition of that entire mass of ammonium nitrate and that is what you know created that enormous blast so this was probably for those of who you don't like chemistry this was probably an annoying detour i'm sorry i can't really help uh, it when it comes to science but it's an interesting concept right like you can take a substance that is so harmless that actually feeds you in a way and you burn it with a flame and nothing really happens but you combine it with fuel and it suddenly becomes dangerous and you heat it to a certain level and it becomes far more dangerous you know it's 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 magical how chemistry works sometimes you know uh in fact here's a fun fact you can use an oxidizer like ammonium nitrate uh, you know or uh, potassium permanganate or you know perchlorates these are typically used as oxidizers and if you mix them with powdered sugar uh, if you are in a college that has a chemistry lab try and ask your uh, you know chemistry teacher to show you this because you can actually make amateur rocket fuel using these two things sugar is a fuel because it has lots of carbon it's a hard, it, it it's a carbon and hydrogen sort of structure and then you have this amazing source of ox- oxygen and it combines to burn really well and you can actually ask your teacher to show you if i don't know if it's legal definitely don't do this yourself it can get risky but if in a controlled environment under a trained chemist uh, why not you know see if you can uh, check it out so this is the story of ammonium nitrate the culprit behind that blast and this chemical ammonium nitrate has actually been used in a lot of terrorist attacks in the past as well i think that there was a 2011 uh, bomb blast in delhi 
ammonium nitrate was used in that and there was one uh, i think in karachi or somewhere and it's it's quite common you know because it's so easily available so it's a dangerous chemical that's what happened so with all of that aside i think we went too much into what really happened in beirut now let's come to the the second half of the question how do we avoid something like that from happening in our country or in any country for that matter well it's very straightforward right if you know a substance is harmful either by itself or in combination with another substance then as soon as a substance like that comes into your territory or into your port you want to be tracking every gram of it uh, you know like a hawk there needs to be a system that tracks it and there needs to be a deadline that needs to be set which says we need to get rid of this by a certain point and if not then we are going to do it ourselves we auction it or we just throw it away or you know we send it back on the ship i don't know how the ports do this but effectively whether it's an explosive or it's a corrosive or it's a biohazard or it's a you know some dangerous pharmacological substance any such substance all you want to do is make sure that you are tracking it and if it exceeds the amount of time that you are comfortable with it staying at one place in your port then you need to have measures that you know get on top of it and uh, you know just disp- just sort it out basically make sure it's not there so that's all that really needs to happen i'm pretty sure our systems are robust for that because such an explosion or such a mishap has not happened uh, at least in indian ports in my recent memory so looks like we have uh, you know things under control hopefully and that is how you prevent something like that from happening jayesh uh, for those of you who you don't like chemistry once again sorry about the um mm, the chemistry detour but uh, i think it's fascinating uh, how fertilizer can be an explosive all right now we come to the third question of the day this is from k joseph and joseph is asking is it possible to create a completely new internet independent of any government control hmm it's a involved question right so the question is can we create an internet so you are watching this probably through some broadband or some wifi or some mobile data right can we create an internet that is completely independent of any of these systems infrastructures and not under government control right if i were to show you something illegal on this channel the government would stop stop me right so could we create a network where the government would have no control could we do that think about that for a second it's an interesting thought experiment so think about that while i take a sip of my uh, filter coffee right so we want to create an internet that is independent of government control fine when you think of the internet the first impression that you have is that it's an enormously complex widespread convoluted web and network of a lot of components right there are computers and mobiles and transmitters and receivers and cables and you know routers service providers and servers and you know web hosting and you know it's a mess right if you think about the internet it just seems like wow it's an impossible task so as a general rule when you are analyzing any system that seems too complex to you know analyze like that the first thing you want to do is try and break down that system into its component parts like what is the fundamental functional unit of a system what is it so let's do that exercise for the internet so what is the internet if you break it down to the smallest functional component what is it an internet is basically a communications protocol and sometimes there is an authentication protocol right i may be missing some nuances here and there but roughly speaking that is what the internet is whether you are watching this video or you are talking to you know someone on whatsapp call or you know you are buying a ticket online whatever it may be you are essentially getting authenticated as who you are and you are able to receive and send information or data or you know whatever right that is what it is it's a communications and authentication protocol at the core of it so as soon as you figure that out you say okay well if it's just that then you can start with the simplest building block and try and work your way upwards and hopefully end up with the vast 
unimaginably complex internet that we are part of today right so suppose uh, joseph right so suppose joseph has a roommate ravi right now they decide to create a parallel internet because they are sick of you know this you know geo and airtel and all these monopolies they say ki nahi hum khud ka banayenge right the simplest version would literally be two laptops connected by a lan cord or an ethernet cable as it's called that's it because once you do that you can write software that allows them to talk to each other you can send messages and files and what not that's it that's your first functional unit of an internet now if you live in a college if you live in a hostel or something which has uh, you know uh, uh, like a central switch as it's called where all the lan cords go we used to have that in my time you can basically connect a lot of computers within one organization or one physical space through something called a switch and then you have what is called an intranet an intranet is just an internet that is restricted or limited to within an organization right so if all of you did that then you would have that in fact we had exactly that when i was in college uh, maybe some of you can recognize this it's called dc++ there was this incredible software which linked all the college uh, colleges computers uh, you know you had to install the software of course but because there was an intranet there was a lan network we were all connected to each other and we could share files send messages look at each others uh, you know uh, shared folders and all that without ever needing access to the outside internet this was fully functional and i have lived through it you know fond memories there right for those who those of you who know what i'm talking about now we have gone from two people with their laptops connected by an ethernet cable to an entire hostel to an entire organization and you keep building that up and you will eventually get to a point where you have created your own internet right sounds very simple right but not so fast because here comes the tricky part the internet that we imagine today connects the entire world right which means to say suppose i want to open the official government website for singapore that's probably going to be government.sg or something like that right how if i went and type that in my browser and i hit enter how is that website coming to me where do you think it's coming from of course the final node is coming from my wifi router to my receiver to my laptop right but where is the source of that where is that thing hosted as we say like which server is it hosted on right so it's probably hosted on a server in singapore given that we are opening the website for the government of singapore makes sense so how is that actually coming to you so here is the interesting part and i'm smiling because a lot of people that i have spoken to don't really give too much thought to how the internet is actually delivered to you you know we think it's wireless and you know you just ask for a wifi password and like magic it comes to you right but in reality the internet is delivered to you through these long massive uh, undersea cables they are optical fiber cables that literally sit on the ocean bed and they connect land masses like they connect africa to asia and southeast asia to india and you know the european continent to the americas and so on like it, that is the nut and bolt version of the world okay so if you want to recreate today's internet and you want to truly have a global connected internet then you are going to have to go and lay your own cables in fact you can go online and search for undersea internet cable map or something and you will see all it's they, you should find a website with an interactive map of all the cables that are around and you can see which one is reliances and which one is owned by you know someone else and so on so you will if you want to create an internet of your own independent of all of this infrastructure you are going to have to go and lay these underwater cables which is an extremely expensive affair and uh, i mean it is no easy task right now suppose you were to circumvent this and go the elon musk way and say okay i'm going to build a constellation of satellites and i am going to just beam the internet straight to you to your receiver and that's how my internet is going to be delivered fair enough let's consider both of these modes of creating your own internet suppose you were to go all that way and create that right the last part of your question is where it gets very tricky government control how do you keep it rid of government control where does the government have control where does the government have authority pretty much anywhere where it has jurisdiction right 
where in the world does the government have jurisdiction and when i say the government i mean any government we are not talking about any one specific government right and the answer is probably every corner of the world like every inch of the world is probably uh, you know for all practical purposes is under the jurisdiction of something it's either maritime law out at sea or it is sovereign law when it you know when you are on the land of either china or india or the us or wherever right so if you want to keep something completely free of government control you are going to have to figure out a way that the government cannot touch your infrastructure or your assets if it wants to how do you plan on doing that you know except for these random anomalies that are rounding errors on maps uh, you know there is this place somewhere in i think the border of sudan and egypt and there is one more i think somewhere in albania or something there are these random anomalies on the maps which are basically rounding errors where no country has jurisdiction you know nobody really polices that land you might be able to set up something there but it's impractical and it doesn't really serve any purpose because people are everywhere your internet needs to be everywhere so wherever you put up your systems even if you deliver your internet through satellites right your satellite has to beam it to something and that something has to be on the ground where a government has control right so it could just seize your receivers or if it's going from the inter- the satellite straight to your phone for example then the government could simply mandate the phone manufacturer to not allow these connections because the manufacturer has to respond to and comply with the laws of the land so as beautiful and fantastic uh, and egalitarian this idea sounds that we can create a parallel internet independent of any government control it is unlikely that you will pull this off unless you create some sort of a technology that is undetectable and um, you know just nobody really knows how it works you know just hidden assets uh, that just deliver data from point to point and you know you build a network of that and until somebody figures it out and reverse engineers it you might be okay but you know even that is not going to last so while it's a very interesting thought joseph unfortunately it seems unlikely that an internet like that is going to exist any time in the near future as long as governments have jurisdictions and if they stop doing that we are probably going to descend into a lawless society so there's not much hope on that side of the story either so there goes your dream of building a independent internet uh, i am sorry uh, it seems unlikely but if you manage to create it against all odds well you know where to find me i will sign on right let us now come to the fourth question of today and this question is from an amazing username there are a lot of special characters in this username but it's it it reads as bhojpuriya batman i love the creativity on that and the question is what are your thoughts on the abortion debate happening in america right now all right again context in america uh, contrary to what a lot of people might find obvious abortion is not such an open and shut topic there's a lot of it's a contentious topic there's a lot of discussion and debate that goes on in the us uh with regards to you know the right to abortion and stuff like that in specific what's happening right now is that there was this historic judgment that was passed in the early 1970s 72 or 73 something like that it was called roe versus wade in which the supreme court basically ruled that women had the right to terminate their pregnancy okay roughly speaking that is what it was a new supreme court bench is about to overturn that decision or scrap that previous decision which means it will effectively open the door to making abortion illegal in america right it's already illegal in a lot of states i believe so women who need abortions need to travel to you know a neighboring state or the nearest state where they want it so that's that's a debate that's happening in the us and uh, it's a very contentious topic as you can imagine because it directly affects one half of the population and indirectly affects the other half so it's a roaring debate and it's i think it's just about to be uh, uh struck down that judgment so basically uh, it, i'm recording this on the 20th of may friday 2022 i'm not sure if it's already happened but it was supposed to happen one of these days and it's very likely to go through so the question is 
what are my thoughts on this abortion debate happening in america right now so first things first i am not one of those people who thinks it's their business to have a passionate opinion or uh, you know uh, feel very strongly about what's happening in a different geography in a different jurisdiction and it's not out of you know uh, lack of empathy or callousness something like that it simply means it, it it simply means to me that if a decision does not have any consequence on me and i don't have any say in the decision to begin with then i don't really have to concern myself with it too much right uh so what happens in america with regards to this debate is unlikely to affect my life in any way shape or form because i don't live in america i have no intention of living there and gone are those days when india's policies were to a large extent influenced or benchmarked against you know the policies and the moralities of the west we have thankfully left that era behind and now we sort of at least do our best to try and come up with our own paradigms so in that respect as much as i have a strong opinion about this which i will come to i don't really care what they do in america it's their country they have their own system their democracy is older than ours in the current form of you know uh, this nation states that we live in so let them do their thing we will watch we will hope for the best and that's about that i don't really have any thoughts on that you know it's it's their country but i'm guessing you are asking this question from the point of view of this debate cropping up in india where we live you know or my area of concern for example would be uh, would would extend to the indian subcontinent because i consider all of these people as my own people this is from a civilized national point of view this is who we were this is who we are and over a period of time hopefully we will sort of you know learn to live together once again right so if a discussion like that comes up in our area of the world right or in our specific country where would i sit so again there's no point jumping to an obvious answer let's analyze this uh, and try and figure out how this affects people right so how might you go about analyzing the quality of a decision because at the end of the day this is a decision to be made right we want to decide whether abortion should be legal or not so how do you want to analyze this think about that for a second where i take another sip of my amazing filter coffee okay lovely right we are talking about abortion rights in india now okay first things first i want to put a caveat right at the start typically you should not judge a decision by its outcome this may seem a little counterintuitive but it's generally considered a bad idea to judge a decision purely by its outcome you want to judge a decision only by the quality of the decision given the circumstances and the information you had available when you had to make that decision all right so for example you might decide something right now which makes sense right now but the outcome did not really work fair enough it's fine right on the other hand you might make a decision that was terrible and but things work out miraculously it doesn't make it a good decision you should generally judge a decision by the quality of the decision itself given the information you had at that point and the context of the situation right okay having said that if you want to understand if a decision is going to be good or bad one method that i like to use is uh, i don't know what it's called i don't know if there's a formal name for it but i like to think of it as how does it affect all the stakeholders right what other way can there be to decide if something is good or bad you just look at who it affects like all the people it affects to what degree and then see if it affects them positively or negatively right it can be anything like if you are a family and you decide to sell the house you will think about it from that point of view right like how does it affect people who are concerned with that house how does it affect the people in the house how does it affect 
uh you know maybe there is a neighbor who relies on you for some sort of care and you sell the house and you move away a lot of complexities come in but mota mota you just want to look at the stakeholders of any decision and stakeholder can be very crudely defined as people who have a say in and some consequence to suffer or gain as a as a result of a decision all right so let us look at the decision of uh, uh, sorry not a decision but let's look at this situation where there is a pregnancy and a decision needs to be made whether or not it should be legal to terminate that pregnancy right now whenever there is a pregnancy who are the stakeholders in that system right i would say the first and the most important stakeholders are number 1 the mother number 2 the child some might say the child and the mother are equally important some might even say the child is more important but i am putting the child at number 2 because the child is yet to be born while the mother is already here right so for me it's one two mother child then it would probably be the immediate family uh, or immediate uh, you know uh, social structure where the child is born and the fourth would be civic society in general right that is roughly speaking the Uh, you know uh, decreasing order of impact from uh, any pregnancy or any child being born right so let's look at this situation where there is a pregnancy and the mother doesn't want that pregnancy you know the expecting mother does not want to have a child at that point in time how does it affect the mother how does it affect the woman who's pregnant well i can think of several ways it affects that woman a she doesn't want to have the child right if you force someone to do something they don't want and this is not like you know drinking orange juice this is like raising a human being inside of you and then once that thing really finally gets out look looking after that for the next 15 20 years right it's an enormous commitment and to force it on someone right off the outset seems like a pretty sketchy dodgy idea to me right maybe the mother had plans to do something with her life maybe this is just not a good time financially to have a child maybe the pregnancy is out of some sort of sexual abuse or rape how do you know what it is right so in my opinion from you know all the possibilities that i can think of a mother is more likely than not going to be adversely affected by forcing her to have a child that she does not want okay now i've heard some arguments where people say you know once you actually hold a child there is this genetic response that kicks in from you know millions of years of evolution because one of the things we are deeply programmed to do is procreate and that washes away all doubt and you know there is unconditional love sure i'm not saying a mother who didn't want a child is not going to love that child but my sense is it's not going to be the same kind of ex- experience or, or or situation if she really wanted that child and you know was eagerly uh, you know waiting for it to arrive right so for me it's open and shut the mother is you know adversely affected now let's come to the child would you want to be a child that was never wanted in the first place would you imagine this your parents were pregnant with you they wanted to abort that pregnancy because they didn't want to have a child or they were not in a good place or whatever the reason may be but because of the existing laws they had to give birth to you and to raise you would you want to be that child right now this is a very harsh question very personal question maybe a lot of us are kids like that you know because even though abortion may be legal it it is still quite quite taboo in a lot of parts in india right uh so maybe a lot of us are children like that like we don't know like thankfully we don't know imagine knowing that right but again my sense is that a child that was never wanted isn't going to get the same level of love affection care that a child who was eagerly wanted and awaited is going to get so it's it may not be an altogether negative experience but it's for me certainly not going to be at the same level that i believe every child deserves right every child deserves to be loved and wanted you know uh, you know you want that child to be something that the family is really passionate about you know children are a project of the future you know they aren't a responsibility that you stomp on top of someone and you say here take care of this now for the next 20 years right 
so as i see it the mother and the child are both very heavily inverse uh, adversely affected by forcing them uh, to have the child instead of an abortion these two are the major stakeholders and this is where the case is already closed for me but for the sake of argument and discussion let's go to the other two stakeholders uh let's look at the immediate family now the family didn't want the child either i don't imagine them being very happy about being forced to have a child and finally society at large bunch of children who nobody wanted and were raised in homes that were probably not the ideal environment to raise children at the time again i don't see them positively contributing to society maybe they will not be a negative contribution but i don't see it being an overwhelmingly positive contribution enough to overturn the negative impacts on the mother and child already so for me given all of these things exist i think it's a pretty clear case of uh, you know uh, allowing people to have abortions uh, if they so choose to so long as it is safe for the mother right that is a that is something we need to sort of be mindful of because i think the first trimester is okay and then after that i don't know i'm not a gynecologist but roughly i think the first trimester is fine and then after that it becomes very uh, you know risky for the mother so that is how i have arrived at my conclusion if this debate ever comes up in our country i am firmly in the corner of allowing people to get abortions uh, and luckily this is a discussion that has never come up in our legal and constitutional uh, circles luckily for us let's hope it stays that way and yeah let's see what happens in america let's see what they decide let's see what the arguments are let's see what the fallout of this uh, decision is we'll see we'll see and learn right that's that's how it is okay now we come to the last question of today and this question is from ronil I think this is the second question that Ronil has asked in only the third episode so thank you Ronil I think I'll send you a book just like that as a thank you uh and the question is is press media really the fourth pillar of democracy well good question very good question um how do we think about this how do we think about whether or not press media is really the fourth pillar of democracy right to go there let's first understand what the first three pillars of democracy are it is generally believed that the three major pillars of democracy are uh, the judiciary the legislation and the executive right so the judiciary so that there is justice and uh, legislative so that there is a process where you elect representatives who then modify or update the the laws of the land or the constitution to reflect the will of the people and finally the executive whose job is to implement and enforce these laws and make sure that the entire system runs like right? these are the three primary pillars of democracy now why is there a fourth pillar why is uh, press media called the fourth pillar of democracy the answer should be quite obvious it's because government systems are by definition quite opaque they don't you, if you remember how much struggle our country had to go to just to get that rti law passed and even then it was a pretty diluted law i think uh given all of that and given how government systems work it is quite clear that they are opaque systems they don't really it's not in their interest to allow a lot of scrutiny because nobody wants to be under scrutiny right and the second reason is that who the government isn't the government the judiciary the legislative the executive you know these are not some you know uh, ideal characters created by god you know and then uh, completely moral and ethical beings or you know fully honest people it's not like that they are all human beings just like you and me they have their own personal objectives they have their ideological objectives they have their um you know their flaws they have their blind spots it they are all human so by definition the system is prone to manipulation to mistakes and you know to to subversion of justice and you know so on so given all of this exists you need a fourth independent body to hold a magnifying lens to these first three branches or pillars that is the judiciary the legislative and the executive and report and let the electorate know whether things are happening correctly or not 
right that is the primary function of the fourth pillar of democracy that is the press media right that is why it's there i hope you can appreciate why it's necessary because the people in government the people in the judiciary people in the legislative and people in the executive have no incentive to be transparent none they benefit from being opaque and hiding behind closed doors and doing their discussions in hushed hushed tones not really revealing the the rationale behind their decisions they benefit from that right but it is in the electorate's interest the democracy's interest to know why certain things were done if they were done correctly and so on and so on right so i think that part is fairly uh, uh, you know well understood so the question is is press media really the fourth pillar of democracy to answer that ronel first thing we needed to answer answer or understand was why it is called the fourth pillar in the first place and i hope that is plenty clear to everyone at this point now let us look at whether it is really the fourth pillar of democracy or not okay so what does the media need to do right forget about media for a second actually what does a system or a body need to do to make sure that these bodies are held accountable right because we established that that's the primary function of the fourth pillar accountability right what function does it need to serve well it needs to be able to write freely most important thing right be unbiased correct and have the necessary access so that it can actually do the reporting correctly right maybe i'm missing out on a couple of things but roughly speaking mota mota i think if these three things are covered where a media is free to report what they want it is Uh, empowered to get access to the information that it needs and finally it is an unbiased media then it will do its job flawlessly right roughly speaking i think these would suffice now let's look at these one by one first things first do you think the media in india is free free as in do they have the freedom to report what they like think about it for a second do you think the media in india is free got a love uh, filter coffee <laughs> okay so let's think about it for a second right how do you define if or how do you figure out if a media is free or not right to do that you have to take one step back and look at who can punish the media if they write or publish something that is negative or that is against the interest against the vested interests of people in power and who is in power three bodies are in power the judiciary the legislative and the executive the judiciary is the judges their collegium basically uh, the legislative is every elected you know right from the panchayat to the you know civic polls to mlas to mps to you know cabinets and chief ministers and prime minister everyone governor even all of that right and the final is executive which is your entire uh, bureaucracy basically your isa ias your uh, you know uh, ips your ifs your state uh, commissions and so on and so on right all these officers that make the show run so we are talking about whether the press is free in india or not i'm i'm you haven't really specified india ronel but i'm going to speak in context of india because this is the i'm myopic to this subcontinent let's just put it like that right so a good way to judge that is to see whether there have been reports that clearly speak against the government or the judiciary or the executive and they are able to do that without any fallout or retribution right so do you think there are articles that are published on a daily basis or you know once in a while when it's uh, important that completely you know completely uh, uh, you know uh, you know blast the government or the judiciary or so on right my sense is that while the freedom of press is not absolute in our country i think we still enjoy a very high level of press freedom because you see articles every day that are criticizing some court judgment or they are criticizing some government initiative or they are criticizing the you know the mismanagement or the corruption in some uh, you know civic body or some branch of the government right the branch of the executive so while 
there have been cases where there are targeted attacks on journalists and it has been happening in our country for a very long time there's a very long and illustrious uh, 50 60 year old history of uh, attack on the freedom of press in our country press and publication uh, better learned people have spoken about that so i won't go into that but i think despite all of that except for maybe the 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 couple of years during which uh, you know our ex prime minister shrimati indira gandhi ji had imposed emergency except for those couple of years i believe that the press in our country has more or less enjoyed a reasonable degree of freedom because they are able to write negative and absolutely negative and caustic articles on a day to day basis and nothing really happens to them right so for me the press freedom is more or less intact it can always be better it like uh you know in places like uh, you know scandinavia for example apparently it's supposed to be the highest sure we can always strive for those levels but we are certainly not bad in that respect as i see it all right so that covers the freedom part what was the next one the next one was whether the media has access to actually report things uh and get access to information so that they can report it correctly now this is a very uh subjective and sketchy sort of uh uh discussion uh because it's very hard to know what they have access to and what they don't but from my understanding from the few press reporters and uh, you know journalists that i know if they don't have direct access then they have their sources because you see not everything is going to be explicitly revealed to the media but a lot of media outlets the good ones they spend years and years and years building these networks that penetrate each of these uh, bodies maybe not so much the judiciary but certainly the legislative and the executive right and they have their own networks they have their own sources and so on so by and large i think if a media body has been around for long enough and they have done it well enough access to information should not be such a big problem uh, so i would give that a tick as well that leaves us with the last uh, uh you know the last uh, criteria which is bias right so again take a moment and think about it do you think the media that we have in india today don't look at any one outlet that you admire or you hate you know that is a sure shot path to building a bias and you know dogma don't do that look at the entire media in general and just ask yourself if there is a bias a perceptible and recurring bias once in a while if there is one opinion piece that is biased that is okay that happens all the time but is there a recurring and consistent bias or not and a good way to test this is you can actually do this experiment take a few publications take a few media outlets that you report on topics of national importance right take the ones that you like take the ones that you don't like okay and take the ones that you are indifferent to right take all of them take the same search term you know something that is contentious preferably something that's a contentious topic in this country that people are uh, likely to disagree on and create a lot of debate around all right and search for the same term on all these different media outlets and look at the trend line of the last 20 articles that they have published on that topic right it's not hard to find contentious issues especially in a country like ours but i can give you a few to start off with uh let's see you can do farm laws you can do uh narendra modi uh or you can do in any era you can do a search for the current uh, prime minister of that time uh or the leading head of state you can do it within a state itself uh, uh and in any era or you can do maybe uh, think of all the recent laws and discussions that have happened there's farm laws there's kashmir issue uh there is triple talaq there is uh, uh, ayodhya verdict think of all of these and go and search for the same thing on a multitude of platforms same term and look at the last 20 articles don't just look at one article right in my opinion and i have actually done this experiment uh, i've done it a while ago when i first started realizing what's happening but what i saw is that 
there is a stratification of our media that's happening there are people who are very pro to one ideology and there are some who are very anti to one ideology and then uh, thankfully there are still some who seem to be somewhere on the fence uh, who want to do some fair reporting but then everybody has their own bias right so for me personally there is a for, okay let me paraphrase that for me personally the bias is very clear and very apparent and very persistent in our media the good news is that it is true for pretty much any country on this planet i don't think there is any country that doesn't suffer from this uh malaise of biased reporters or biased journalists right and for me personally media started losing its credibility when journalists started fancying themselves as some sort of saviors of democracy or saviors of uh, social justice or civic society or some nonsense like that you know i i pay to get news and for me news is typically facts a chain of events and maybe at the end some sort of conclusion on what this might mean in the greater context of things what we have generally speaking now is opinion pieces that are masquerading as news items and this has become very common you know you just go and do the same experiment that i just told you and there will be some publications that make it seem like like this has been the golden era of our civilization whereas there will be others that will make you feel like you know this is the worst crisis there is recession genocide everything happening all at once you know neither of them are to be respected neither of them are really true but this is the nature of the media that we have today luckily the 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 way out of it or as as individuals as free thinking individuals the way to isolate yourselves from this bias is to actively go and read the same piece of news from multiple news outlets right that is something you can do and that typically gives you different points of view it gives you different hopefully not different facts but different points of view and then you are free to sort of make up your own mind about you know what makes sense and what doesn't and it's perfectly fine if one thing is okay with someone and it's not okay with someone because at the end of the day we are all separate free individuals with our own objectives in life what i want for this country doesn't necessarily have to coincide with what you want in this country right all that matters is that we take a constitutional approach to achieving our objectives as long as that happens it's okay to disagree i won't get everything i want and you won't get everything you want but as a society we will more or less get what we want given enough time that is my hope and that is my belief uh, to what extent i am right only time is going to tell but i hope this gives you enough perspective on the media how to look at it why it is important and how to uh, inoculate yourself from this malaise of biased media with all these journalists who fancy themselves as activists now such a sad sad thing that has happened um the second sad thing that has happened is what is called editorialization of headlines uh so headlines have become very clickbaity if you've noticed right because you know when the media is free when the news item is free then you are the product right like your attention is being sold to advertisers and the way to get you to click is to make the headline uh, you know seem like it is editorialized whether it is something sensational so this sensationalism has also crept in but it can easily be avoided by simply reading the whole article i think we are all guilty of not reading the whole article we are all guilty of just reading the headline and assuming we have a very good grasp of what is happening that is something we don't want to do we want to invest the time it takes to actually read the entire article and that is actually reading entire articles and reading from a multitude of sources is really the only antidote to the media that we have today so to answer your question in short ronel after giving you that you know nice looping detour around pillars of democracy and you know the the, the style of reporting that we have today the answer is the media is not the fourth pillar of democracy in and of itself but you can make it one by being more responsible news consumers right and i have told you how to do that so i hope that answers your question ronel 
thank you for coming back and asking a second question i really uh, appreciate it it's only my third episode so to have a repeat user as an entrepreneur i know the value of a repeat user more than most people uh, so i am very very happy that you come back thank you uh, with that i will make my happy announcement once again if you find anything on this episode that was factually incorrect or logically inconsistent please point it out in the comments below and if you have a legitimate point i will take your address and i will send you one of my favorite books as a thank you for paying attention and thinking critically and not taking everything i say at face value do your own thinking that is my only message for you with that thank you very much if this was good for you if you enjoyed this discussion if uh, if if this added any value to your life please do subscribe because uh, well i want to turn this into something substantial and i can't do it without your help uh, if you liked something in particular or you disliked something in particular please let me know either via email or by comments i love praise but i love criticism even more give me that and with that i will leave you for today have a wonderful uh, weekend it's friday have a good rest of the day enjoy your life bye and uh, jai hind